1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be reading from verses 23 to 27. This will actually start a three-part series uh, for us called Fasting for the Gospel. Fasting for the Gospel. So we will begin this today here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verses 23 to 27. When you've found it, say, I've got it. And those of you who don't have it, it's on your overhead. <laughs> Here's what the Word of God says. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. So, and then he goes on to say, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. So I do not run aimlessly, no, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified may God add the blessing to the reading of his word the first message in this series that we'll be preaching today is fasting for the gospel in me fasting for the gospel in me let's bow our heads father we thank you today oh how wonderful you are father what manner of love is this that you have bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons the daughters the children of god and here we are your children and for those who are not yet those who will be we come to your word that you would open our eyes and we may, as the psalmist prayed, see wonderful things out of your law. Lord, do a work in us. Cause what you have put in us to come to such fruition. A passion is lived out of our life for the glory of Jesus Christ. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Fasting for the gospel in me. Fasting for the gospel in me. So we begin a three-week series called Fasting for the Gospel. This week, Fasting for the Gospel in me. Next week, Fasting for the Gospel through me. Week after that, Fasting for the Gospel that is upon me. Today's message, Fasting for the Gospel in me. Because we have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ by embracing his sacrifice for our sins, the cleansing of his blood, which has taken away our guilt, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who has given us a new heart, we now engage in practices and spiritual disciplines that allow for the gospel to practically transform our lives so more specifically fasting is significant for everyone who can say that the gospel is in you we are not uh, fasting because we want to lose weight you know it's culturally acceptable to go on fast so you can drop a couple of pounds and quite frankly if you're fasting you will lose a little weight but that's not why we fast some of us are hoping to see breakthrough and uh, spiritual breakthrough. Things are healings and deliverances and often that will come and take place in fasting. But do you realize that's not why we're fasting either? No, we are fasting that we might draw closer to Christ. And I cannot say this any clearer. We don't fast to get saved. 
or to try to make it in or make it to heaven. You're fasting because you are saved. Because his grace is in you. That's why we're talking about the gospel in me. We are fasting because of the gospel is in me and there's something that's going to come out of me as a response to the gospel. And fasting is like water. It's one of the agents that God uses, one of the spiritual disciplines that God uses where when he puts a seed in the ground and he puts the water there, that water starts a chemical reaction that unleashes the potential of that seed. And fasting is one of those spiritual disciplines that God uses to literally bring us into the fullness of who we are made to be by his grace. The grace of God is in me, and therefore a new course and a holy purpose has been set, and we will follow it. Our scripture that we read today helps us grasp the attitude of the disciple of Jesus Christ in this new path that the gospel has brought us into. So if I said to you, we're going to, uh, so when we're looking at our passage, um, and if, if I said to you uh, something equivalent to what our passage says, if I said to you the Super Bowl, what do you think I'm talking about? I think I'm talking about football. There are very few of you in this room who would say, I've never heard of such a thing. What is that? When is it coming? What does it mean? Most of us are very familiar with the Super Bowl. Uh, and even if you don't appreciate football, you've heard it. And you understand that it's the champions from two conferences that will play together in this game who determines who the champion is. And you understand that the winner is called the, cha the world champion. Forget about the fact that it's only in the United States. Uh, but they're still the champion of the NFL. So it is in our passage when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? To run that you may obtain it. When he says that in a race, he's actually making an allusion to a very specific race that everyone in Corinth would have been aware of. Just like everybody, most of us are aware that tomorrow uh, Clemson is playing Alabama. Uh, most of us, don't, don't clap, we're not, we're, this church is not for Alabama or Clemson, it's totally different than being like for Duke or the Tar Heel. Uh, we, don't, we don't take a stance, we don't take a stance. But I think you know where I stand. Um, no, everyone in Corinth, the minute he said race, they're aware of what he's referring to. He's talking about the Isthmian games. That's uh, a part of, that's the games, that's a part of the culture of ancient Greece. It actually took place in Corinth. It was an athletic competition in honor to the sea god Poseidon. And those in Corinth, um, they were the host of those games. And even when the Roman uh, government took over, uh, these games continued. They were right below the Olympic Games. And so when he's talked about a race and a prize, it probably piqued the interest of the hearers because they understood what he was referring to. And so he, in our text, he alludes to two sports uh, or two particular areas of competition in those games, running and boxing. And since the beginning of the Olympics, the games have revolved around these two sports. There's a bunch of uh, uh, competitions regarding running, and then we have boxing and wrestling and all kinds of areas of grappling. And those who were in these competitions, they were in it because they wanted to be declared the best, the fastest, the strongest, 
the toughest of all the athletes of the world. They wanted, in essence, to be the champions. And today, for, today it's funny, we run often socially, we run for health, we run just to enjoy. Uh, this is quite different than why they ran in the past. Uh, they ran to win. Uh, you know, some people uh, just want to play a game. We were over the Christmas break, I think we were playing a game, and the question had to be asked, do we care if we win? Do we want to actually take score, or do we just want to enjoy it? Well, some were like, we want to enjoy it, and some who I won't name were like, uh-uh, we need to take score. I need to know if I win. That's the kind of mindset they had. In 1996, when the Barcelona Olympics was taking place, there was a shoe company that advertised that their tagline was, was this. They said, you do not win the silver medal, you lose the gold. <laughs> the whole point was, uh, you're not in this competition to just compete. You're not in the competition to do well. You're in the competition to win it. You're in it to win it. That was the mindset uh, of, those, of the Olympics. And so Paul uses this familiar cultural idea and practice of the Olympics to convey the nature of the Christian life. We are competitors by spiritual birth. Now, I'm not, now I want you to know something. I'm talking about being spiritual competitors. If I was talking about the flesh, now those of you who know me know I'm a little bit competitive. Uh, I have a little competitive streak. I don't like losing. I like winning. If I'm racing with you and you're ahead of me, uh, I try not to trip you. Uh, but I, I am a little bit competitive. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between the natural competitive drive versus the spiritual competitive drive. When, in the natural, when we're competitive, we're competing against often other people. Or in some sense, uh, or, or if you're in golf, like they say, you compete against the course or you compete against yourself, but uh, that's in the natural. In the spiritual, you're not competing against other people. So you don't look around in this room and say, you, you, I'm trying to beat you. I'm trying to, you're the one I'm trying to take down. Not spiritually. No, if there is someone we're overtaking, it's the enemy. It's the enemy of our soul. It's not one another. There is no one in the world you're competing with. No matter what they believe, no matter how they live, no matter what they think, they are not your enemy. They are not your competitor. That is the enemy of our soul. So we don't compete spiritually against a fellow man. Paul is not saying we are running to win against one another. No, 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 no. We're running to win what God has set in front of us. And there is an enemy who wants to stop us from winning. But let's be clear, you and I are not the enemy. If we listen to Paul and we look at his, he speaks about this competitive, he speaks about the Christian life in a, in a spiritually competitive sense. Look at Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 12 to 14. In this passage, he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining towards what lies ahead, he goes on to say, I press on towards the goal for what? The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not just running for Christ just to run. I'm not, I'm not in this thing because my family was. No, there's a spiritual competitor. When God saved me, something was in me, and I've got to get the prize for which I was saved for. I'm not just hanging around. I'm in it to win it. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10 he speaks of the way that the gospel impacts him. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. So here, again, he's not competing with anyone. He's saying, I'm telling you, when God came in my life, I must admit, I, there was such a passion for him. I had such a drive. I probably worked harder than many of my neighbors, but my, my brothers and sisters. But listen, it was not me competing with them, but there's something about God's grace when it got in me, when he saved me, when he changed my heart, when he gave me a divine purpose, I tell you that thing made me driven for the glory of God. The gospel in me makes you a spiritual competitor. In Hebrews chapter 12, 2 and 3, he continues this whole idea of being in a race of being in a competition. Hebrews chapter 12, he says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Because of what was ahead of me, I look at Jesus who set the model. I'm not just going to sit here and just wait. Remember that song, I'm waiting here by the river until you come. No, 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 I don't sing that song really. We're not just waiting around, just waiting, tick tock on the clock. No, we're something, we're, we're, we're looking for the joy that was set before us and we're pressing towards it. There's a drive that is in the believer. When Paul is about to die, he comes to the end of his life and he describes the Christian testimony and you were to believe he still uses the game as a way to summarize it. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8, he says, for I am already being poured out. He's talking about his death, you know. He says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He said, I have fought the good fight. And then he says what? I have finished the race. And I have kept the, I was in a fight and I fought it well. And I was in a race and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. That's what the athletes would receive, a crown. But in spiritually, we receive a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who love his appearing. Paul looked at his life, the way that he was called, and he said, we're in a race, we're in a fight, and I'm in it to win it, and I'm in it to the end. And he looked back at his life, and he said, God, I can say with clarity and honesty, I have finish the race Christian life is a competitive race with eternal ramifications in the balance we are not Christian hobbyists we are not leisure Christians we are not nominal Christians who like, the, who like our name but are not engaged in faith we are not cultural Christians we are in a race and in a battle. This is so important for us to understand this, and I want to say this uh, because it's interesting when America is often called a Christian nation and then we're in the South and they'll call the South the Bible Belt. And you know what's something very interesting about being here when we moved back to the United States, something I saw, that when I was up North, the, the, the Christian spirituality was much more potent than in the South, which was interesting. I lived in New York City. I lived in Montreal, two secular cities. And you almost can't compare the spirituality. And I want you to understand, it's not, it's not that one area is better than the next, but I want you to understand what we're in danger of. When we were in Montreal, the, nobody even knew the gospel. The postal worker asked me, who is Jesus? He had never heard of the man. And this is a Catholic state, but they gave up on faith a long time ago. They didn't understand faith. So when you were a Christian, you had to walk with God. You, when you were Christian, when we were on campuses, you had to live for Christ because people would judge what Christ was like and who the church was by you because there were so few Christians. 
When we lived in New York, there are Jews, there are Muslims, there, there are Buddhists, there, there, are, there are all kinds of religions all around, your neighbors. And so you walked with the testimony of the gospel and you recognized the way you lived would literally tell people who your God was. We come down south and we don't have to tell nobody anything about God. Everybody's Christian. We're in the Bible Belt. Yeah, we're all Christians. If I say I serve Jesus, everybody say, yeah, me too. I may not have ever read the Bible or I did in, in, in Sunday school. I may not be living for Christ. But listen, we're Christian. We're all saved. The testimony of what it means to be Christian, it's different. When I go to Sierra Leone, there's a difference. There's the Muslim and there's the Christian. And if the Christian doesn't pray, the Muslim prays, what, five times a day. And he looks and says, oh, Christians, oh, we know them. They're not praying people. No, no, you reveal who God is. And I'm telling you, we are in danger in this culture of being nominal Christians, of being hobby Christians, of having a name but not having the power of the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. And I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm saying God is perfecting you. I'm not saying you're without flaw. I'm saying God is doing something in you, and what's not right, God's working it out. Yeah. I'm saying the old people would put it like this. We're not at ease in Zion. <laughs> that doesn't mean something to some of our young people, but that means we're not chilling <laughs> in, in the church. We're not, we're not, how you doing? I'm just chilling, you know, I'm just chilling. No, 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 we're not chilling for Christ. We are serving him with a passion, with a zeal. Isaiah put it like this. I think it was Isaiah 59. The zeal of the Lord is a mantle around me. I'm, in, I'm overwhelmed with the passion to live for Christ. And I want to tell you, you, if Christ abides in you, there's a competitive drive in you to will, to live for God. Now, let's be careful. Don't make that drive a personality type. Don't make it a culture. Don't, don't, you know, because we, we, we can classify what it looks to be saved based on what your church was like. No. What is the word like? I don't care what culture, what nation, what part of the country you live in. The word is the word. And so don't judge me by the church I used to go to. Don't judge me by who my pastor is. Don't judge me by the name out there. Let's look at the word. This, 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 when the word dwells in us because Christ is in our hearts, everybody is held to that drive. Because the drive is not in you from a person, it's in you by God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is not an agreement with God, it is the transforming work of God. So we see in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, Paul says, run to receive the prize. Run so that you may obtain the prize. There's only one prize, and all who have the gospel in them, they want it. Do you hear me? There's only one prize, but if God is in you, you want it. <laughs> you don't want to be left out. You don't care. You're not one of those who, you know, no big deal. No, 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 no. Not if Christ is in you. And I know we get a little nervous now. What are you trying to say, Pastor? What are you trying? I'm saying if God, if God's Son dwells in you, then you want in your heart what God's Son has for you. Amen. Amen. Is that too zealous? Is that, am I, am I crazy? Am, am I out of my mind? No. I'm not waiting for you to answer. Saying the word says this is how it is. This is not Trevor's teaching. This is the Bible. In fact, let's be careful. I saw some silly video of people worshiping a pastor. You don't worship a pastor. Of course, you don't have a pastor to worship. <laughs> I think by now everybody knows how imperfect I am. If you worship in me, you are all people most miserable. <laughs> I'm not someone worthy of that. 
But I see people, people worship artists or they worship personalities, they worship pastors, they worship gifted people. Listen, the prize is Christ. Yes. He is what we want. He is who we want. Amen. In fact, we'll even get a little clearer on that because the gospel in you makes you want to receive the prize. You care about it. In the new year, there are many things we want to accomplish, and we have new year resolutions that help us keep these things in mind. But I want us to remember what our true priority. It's the gospel that gives us the goal that far surpasses all other goals and dreams and hopes and aims. It's the prize of the gospel we want. Philippians 3 and 12, it speaks about it. What does it say? I haven't already obtained what I want, and I'm not perfect right now, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I'm pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I want Christ and what Christ wants for me. I'm living in this life to receive the prize. Philippians tells us that's the mindset. The prize is not merely heaven as a place. Bob Marley jokes about Christianity and talks about the people who just want a pie in the sky. I'm not looking for a pie in the sky. I'm not looking just for a, a, a streets of gold. You know, where the, um, there was a song they used to sing about I, I've got a mansion just over the hillside. Anybody heard of that? I've got a mansion just over the, you know, I don't really know the song fully, but I heard it sung as a kid. Can I tell you, that's not what you're looking for. That's not your prize. And I know we sing, we got to be careful as Christians, the songs we sing, because you may sing a song that's not exactly what you want. Because we're not trying to go to heaven for a mansion. We're trying to go to heaven for Christ. What is the goal? What's the prize that we want. The prize is not merely heaven, but it is found in heaven. It is our reconciliation with God who loves us. It is our divine nature at, as his children. It is our glorious transformation and our eternal, abundant, glorious living. This is what we want. We want to be united with God who made us. And we fail from that, but we're living to fully be who he made us to be, to be able to live with God and not be afraid, to, not, to be able to love one, to be able to live in community and not worry about, are you going to break in, into my house? I'm, I'm, to not worry about whether you're going to do me bad. Do you know when we come to the prize of God, we don't have to worry about our brother because it's a place of love. It's a relationship we're coming to. It's not a building. It's a relationship. It's a holy place, a righteous place. I don't got to worry about my leg. Do you know my, I wear, uh, I, I've gotten into these shoes that I know the body them looks uh, uh, white and I said to somebody these are my dress shoes and he said those are sneakers pastor and I said no they're not but you know as I'm getting a little older and and my weight is is imbalanced let's call it like that <laughs> I've needed better support for my feet you know and so I gotta wear shoes that kind of <laughs> help me help me live life a little bit easier unfortunately young people are like what are you talking about you just wait a couple of years you you'll figure out what I'm talking about but can I tell you there's coming a day where I don't have to worry about my feet or my hip or my neck or my back do you know I sneezed one day and threw out my back I sneezed can you believe a sneeze Good grief. But there's coming a time where I don't have to worry. When I, when I receive the prize of Christ, I'm going to receive a glorified body and tell you, I don't, listen, I'm not worried about abs in this world. I'm going to get a body where, my, where I can never look over my belt or struggle to look over my belt. I'm, I'm telling you, the life that God is, is wanting for you, it's not, it's not a life of loss. It's not a life of pain. It's not a life of drudgery. It's joy unspeakable, as they used to sing, and full of glory. And the half has never yet been told. In other words, we can't even fully communicate how wonderful it is. We just know that the God who created us and who we left in rebellion is the God who says, I'm bringing you back. But when I bring you back, 
I'm bringing you back better than what you made yourself. I'm transforming you. I'm, you're, you're not going to think the same. You're not going to look, look the same. You're not going to enjoy the same. Everything is good. Everything's going to be wonderful. It's the prize. I want more than what I've got. And if you're saying, well, that's not enough, Pastor, then, then, you know, there's a whole lot of people killing themselves because what they have in this world ain't enough. Remember that, that chef, Bourdain? And they talked about, man, he traveled around the world. He ate all the best foods. Man, the people used to say, man, I wish I could be like him. Then he killed himself. Why? Because there was just a drudgery in him. They, they, I know I've done this. I've seen everything, and it's not enough. You know why? Because what he wanted can't be had in this life. Amen. Why did that woman Spade, who designed those purses, and, and she, she, she was a millionaire, and she had everything she wanted, and her marriage fell apart, and she went into depression because she, what the relationship she wanted, the quality of life she wanted, it just, she just couldn't have it. And so she just said, it's not worth living. But I tell you, the life that God gives you, you won't lose. Your relationships won't be broken. Your heart won't be torn in two. It's the prize. Yes. And when God saves us, we recognize I can get better. And I thank God for my wife. But do you know our relationship is great actually now, but it's going to be better in heaven. Thank God for my children. But do you know my, my relationship with them is going to be better because I can never lose them when I get there. It's the prize. It's the prize. And there used to be a time where kids would say, well, I don't understand why we got to wait for heaven. But you know what? Too many kids are losing their life today. And we recognize kids are having to think about eternity like never before. So the prize is in us. If you go back to 1 Corinthians 9 and 23, he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in the blessing. And here's another aspect of the prize. It's not merely that I individualistically will enjoy God's promise for me, but he's saying, I'm not going to do it alone. In other words, what God has for us is never just for you. It's going to be enjoyed with others. And so you don't have to worry about going to heaven and being lonely. Anybody ever been lonely here? I remember hearing a song one day that said, alone again in a crowded room, cornered by the questions in my mind. You can be in a room like this full of people and feel alone. You can, you can live and, and, and can't wait to graduate and you, so you can get married and you finally get the marriage and you're lonely. Got somebody in the bed with you, but you're all alone. And you, find, you waited to have that child, and then you got that baby, and you got the spouse, but you got nobody. But, God's, but Paul says the prize is not just Christ transforming you. It's that Christ says that when I'm working in you, I'm going to make sure that you're not alone in this. That's why Paul says, I'm working. The grace of God is working in me so that the, I may obtain the prize. But not only me, but others are going to obtain it as I share with them the gospel. I love this thing so much, I can't imagine you not loving it and experiencing it too. 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul talks about all, he talks about I've run the race, I've, I've fought the fight. And then he says, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But he then goes on to say, and not only for me, but all who have loved his appearing. In other words, we're not going there alone. I'm not going to worry about being in a dark room in heaven where no, I'm, it's just me and God. And, you know, people say you're going to be worshiping God all the time. And, if, and, and, you know, I know that sounds good in church, but if church is all heaven's going to be about, uh, I know I'm the pastor. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that, but I need more than church. Think about it. No, we need relationship. We need peace. We need joy. We need the camaraderie. We need the encouragement. We need, you want to, you don't just want to eat well. You want to be able to, man, doesn't this, how many of you have done this? Oh, doesn't this taste good? Taste it. How many of you have ever shared your food? Not, I know, you're, some of you germ addicts, so you don't share your fork, but you share, it tastes so good, you want them to taste it. 
That's what it's going to be about. It's going to be enjoying God's presence and sharing it with others. This drive is in you and the prize. Listen, that's why the gospel in us is compelling us to tell others about it. And then he goes on to say, not only does the gospel make you want the prize, but the gospel in you disciplines your life. What does he say? He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Verse 26, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box at one beating the air, but I what? Discipline my body and keep it under control. He says, as the Olympian, that that there's a mindset that we embrace. There's a physical commitment. There's a required regimen. There's a commitment to strict training. When the gospel comes in us, we then can no longer live aimlessly and mindlessly, living meaninglessly, as Ephesians talks about it. So that, in other words, I'm not, when we're apart from Christ, you know, we're often living for nothing. Oh, we'll live for our family. We'll live for our career. We'll live for our toys. But in the big scheme of things, you can lose it all. Did you know that? And I know, the, I know this is hard for parents because we'll, and especially in America, we worship our children. But I tell you something. Worship your children. And they'll grow up. And they could pass or they could abandon you. Now, in most cases, they won't. But someone's gonna eventually leave. If your joy and hope in life is your spouse or your child, you're living for less than what God called you to live for. I felt so bad for this person. They grew up, they, they were raised in, in England, in the UK, and they built a, a, a mansion because of the currency of the of the pound, they built a mansion in one of the Caribbean islands. And so their children went ahead of them. Lord have mercy. The, the child, so they kept sending the money to the child. And the child kept sending them pictures of the house. Then they retired and didn't tell their child they were coming, they were coming to surprise them. You know, they got off the plane, went to the place where the house was being built and found it was just grass. The child had taken the money. Now, obviously, we hope our children would never do anything like that. But it is to say that, wait a minute, you can't worship creation. You cannot worship the gifts of God. You cannot worship your boo, your job, your toy, your children your spouse, worship God. And if we're going to worship God, then, then, then we're going to, it's going to cause us to live in such a way where God is what matters more than anything, that God is glorified above anything. And one of the ways when he talks about, he says, I'm not, I'm in a race, I'm in a match. And so he, he's still talking about the Olympics, but now he moves from the running to the boxing match. And he says, when I'm boxing, I'm not boxing the air aimlessly. No, you know what? I'm, I'm not shadow boxing. I'm boxing the enemy. I'm bringing my body under subjection. In fact, he literally then uses this term. He says, I'm pummeling my body to bring it into discipline so that when I get in a match, I can win. So it says that when you are, when the gospel comes within you, you your lifestyle starts changing. Because it starts coming, you're out of shape. You know, I promised to race my kids the other day. And I just told them, give me a couple of months to get in shape. Well, when they weren't around, I just did a quick sprint. It was quick and short because of how out of shape I am. Paul is alluding to when you are a part, when you come into Christ, you're not in shape. You got to beat your body into subjection to get it to the place where now you can fight the race. You can fight the fight and run the race. You know, that's what fasting is one of those disciplines that helps get us into spiritual 
preparation for the race that is before us. This is why I know in America we want to fast everything but food. But everywhere else in the world, fasting is food. <laughs> at some point, I think that's an amber alert. At some point, you, we fast and we don't give up food so as to just be hungry for God. I'm hungry for Jesus. <laughs> And I'm miserable. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, would you please not walk around miserable? You're not fasting so you could say you're miserable for Jesus. No. You know why you're fasting? You're teaching your body that man cannot live by the gifts of God alone or by bread alone, but by every word, every bread that comes out of his mouth. I'm, in fact, one of the things that fasting does, it, it helps us see what controls us. Richard Foster speaks so well about this. It talks about it, when we fast, we get to see what really dominates our life and drives us. And fasting is one of the things that, li that loosens the grip of the dominators in our life. So some of you think that you're, you're getting mad and you're more angry because you're fasting. When fasting may reveal you got an anger problem. You got a temper problem. You say, well, fasting, I got a headache because, you know, I'm not able to have my coffee. Fasting may reveal that you are too devoted to coffee. That's not fair. I don't drink coffee, so I can say that without any pain. But there's other things that I do like. And fasting helps us answer the question, what really is helping me run this race? And is there anything in my life that's not conducive to it or that I'm overcommitted to it? I love sports. Do I love sports too much? Fasting, I've got to be more focused on God. That's why whenever there's fasting, go to Luke 2 when we talk about Anna or go to Acts chapter 13 when they talk about the Antioch church. It's always fasting and worship or fasting and prayer because fasting is relational. We're never fasting to just deprive ourselves. We're beating our body into subjection so that we can further or more deeply worship Christ or more clearly see what he wants for us. And, uh, and, uh, and so I want to encourage you in this fasting season, fast something. And some of you will say, Pastor, no, 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 my doctor already told me I can't fast. Let me tell you, you can fast. Because in the fasting process, maybe for some, you do have to take something with your medicine. But maybe you don't have to take as much. Because the whole idea is, if I don't eat anything or if I eat less, and I don't pray and I don't get into this word, the fasting has benefited me minimal. It's only been natural. But the spiritual strict, the spiritual training automatically, I'll tell you, in seasons of fasting, my discernment is clearer. I hear God more acutely. I see things in the spirit that I cannot see things apart from being so devoted. In fact, that's why fasting is not something we should do once a year. Fasting is a normative posture. We may not do 21 days fasting every month, but there should be fasting at some point in the month. Trevor, we're not crazy Christians. Maybe that's the problem. We're not crazy Christians. Not that we're Losing our mind. Come on, I'm not I'm scaring some of you. No, but we've got to be more passionate for Christ. Why? Because the gospel that is in us wants to do something so transformational around you that it takes a more disciplined you for God to use. And, and, and we're beating our spiritual body, not our physical body, but our spiritual man, there are, th there are temptations that, you know, the devil presents it. Some of you can be honest. The devil shows up at your door and you just, oh, I can't help it. Oh, God, no, no. I just, uh, and then you keep going back. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. And you love saying, oh, I I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect, I'm forgiven. But at some point, Christ sanctifies you over that temptation. Yeah. At some point, you've got to get victory over it. And so sometimes when you recognize there's something dominating you, oh, God, i got to surrender. 
Remember, there was this girl who liked me, and I was just, and God revealed to me, man, you like that girl way too much. I had to make some adjustments in my life, in my conversations, in my phone calls, in, in my, in many other areas. Because I saw this thing would take my faith down. Fasting causes the gospel to accomplish its purpose in our lives. And lastly, the gospel in you causes disqualification not to be an option. We close with this. He says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, how amazing is this? This is Paul who wrote the Gospels, who, I mean, who wrote many of the epistles. This is Paul who, who healed many people. This is Paul who saw visions that you and I can't imagine. And he says, I got to beat my own body into subjection lest I be disqualified. What's Paul alluding to? I think he's alluding to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. He said, many on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast demons out in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There, it, it is, it, it, you can serve God and be disqualified. One, because look what he says, I never knew you. Because in your service, if this, I'm scared for us. I tell you, The Voice, American Idol, all these games that's on, I, I, I worry sometimes because I was in, I was, when I was in youth ministry, I was around a lot of artists, some of the artists that you know today, and, I, and, and they used to, call, some of them would call the concerts or coming to churches for worship, they called them gigs. Oh, I got a gig at this church. I said, well, I knew of gigs, but that was secular. When you're coming to lead us in worship, that's not a gig. That's. But, but this thing was, they were talented, and some of them couldn't make it in the secular world. You know, Beyonce, they tried out for Beyonce, and she was like, sorry, you ain't one of the single ladies. So we, they had to go to Christianity and come up with a gospel song that would move you. But let me tell you something. If that's, if it's your talent that's got you serving God, if it's your skill, if you're waiting for somebody to be in the audience and say, you better say, on that day, be, a, be, be afraid of whether the Lord says, no, you're disqualified from this process because this was not about me. This was always about you. And you know, I've met people who have done great things for God. I tell you, I'm a pastor, and I'm broken, and I'm, I'm praying every day for others and for myself. I don't, I listen, every day I'm hearing another pastor backsliding, touching somebody's woman or somebody's man, or touching or stealing money, or doing all kinds of madness. And I say, God, I got to beat my body's subjection because I ain't going down. I'm not losing out on this prize. The old people used to say, I mean to make heaven my home. I'm not playing this thing. I'm re listen, I'm not playing this thing. And, and I'm worried, and I want you to know, you can't play around. If you want to follow Christ, then you got to follow him. Then you got, you got to know him. Paul said, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I'm not in this because my daddy preached. I'm not in this because my wife goes to church. I'm not in it because my kids are dancing. I'm not in it because I want to be a good person to my neighbor. I'm in it because of Jesus. And if it's not a about knowing Jesus, I will be disqualified. And let me tell you, what you will lose, you can't imagine. Some of us have lost houses. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have lost inheritances. But if you lose Christ, my God, if you lose him. And I'm worried that some of us ain't afraid of losing him. You're so eternally secure, you're not scared of living in sin and walking into heaven and say, what's up, G? You're so secure. 
I heard of somebody saying, me and Jesus got a good thing going on. Let me tell you, I'm saved, and I'm not worried about backsliding because Paul says, I'm running to obtain that for which I have already been obtained for. So in other words, disqualification is not an issue for you, not because you can't fall, but because you are living to experience that for which Christ purchased you, which is very different. He saved me that I may experience his grace. And so I'm living this life to get what I was saved for, to experience what I was saved for. And so some of us are worried. I talk to some, man, I'm just trying to stay saved. God help us. You can't try to stay saved. Salvation is the work of Christ. But when you recognize he saved you, then you're living in this life to experience in this life and the life to come all that the gospel is trying to bring in and out of you. And when we yield to God and we serve him and we fast and we adore him and we obey him, then this thing is not about my relative, about my culture, about the songs that I like. It is about Christ. And the gospel in me is like a magnet drawn to him. And I'm going here because I'm drawn to him. God has put some things in my mind and some things to do and some relationships to develop and, some, and, some, and, and, and a character transformation to experience. Why? So that I can be even closer with Christ. I want to be where he is. The gospel in me, the gospel in you is drawing that. And fasting as we start this season, some of you are going to experience some breakthrough. There are some worldly things that you're a part of. And I said worldly. I know we don't use that term. Some worldly things you're going to have to break out of because God, God has you in a race and you're going to win. And to run that race, you can't be fat. To run that race, to run that race, you've got to be disciplined. You're going to have to get up and pray. You're going to have to seek God. You're going to have to open his word. You're going to have to say, set times to be with God. Shh, sorry, I can't respond to that text. The text comes, I can't even look at it right now. I got to spend time with Jesus. You know, there's sometimes I'll walk in the room and I want to say, hey, lean. And I walk in. And, and she's having her time with the Lord, and I got to turn around and close the door because I'm her husband, but I ain't her God. She's got to get with God, and, and I can't help her in it. What she needs from the Lord, it's with her. And there are times we come together and we can open the word together, but, but you, the gospel in you, is drawing you closer to Christ. I want us to pray today. Because God is calling us out of cultural Christianity and nominal Christianity. Where we're saved because of our family. Or we're saved because we agree with the teaching. Rather than the, the truth of the gospel is captured us. Father, today. Today. We're in your presence. And your gospel has gone forth. Your word says the grace of God has appeared to all men. You teach us. You transform us. We worldly lust and, and, and all kinds of things in the world, they're dropping off of us because of your grace in us. Your gospel has us in a race where we're running to win. And, and there are some people that won't even stay in our life because the gospel has restricted us that we might only please you. Oh, Father, there's a calling that's in this room for some people. And I'm telling you, this, this thing is going to so transform you, so take you to another level that God's going to take you beyond your, your imagination. But it's only as we yield to the grace of God in us. Are you here today? 
saying the gospel in me is driving me deeper, deeper. It's taking me farther than I've ever gone. It's making me want more than I've ever asked for. It's making me dream of things that I didn't know my mind could desire. It's the gospel. If that's you today, come and pray. If you are, if you are wanting some things that God could only make you want, if there's some appetites, there's some longings in you. The Bible, Jesus tells us in Matthew, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're wanting the things of God. You're wanting a righteous heart and righteous relationship. You're wanting, you're wanting a new relationship. You're wanting reconciliation. There are people who have hurt you. And now, before you wanted to cut them off, but now, God, I want to forgive. I want to be right with them. I want there to be no schism and no issues when our family get together. I want to know them deeper. I want what God wants. Do you feel that? And come on, sometimes, sometimes everybody in your home doesn't want that. But there comes a point where you say, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, that I may have him. 